Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrandt. I am joined, as always, by my good friend. He's a colleague. He's a co-host. For many years, his name is Dan Rubenstein over there in New York City. Sir, how are you? Ty, I am excited. I am ready to go. I could not be looking forward to this show more. We've got a longtime friend coming. We have baseless, baseless predictions. And we get to talk about intellectual things with college football. So it's something for everybody. I was not prepared for this intellectual portion, Dan. (laughs) We never are, Ty. That's what makes us so charming. It is May. It is the college football off season. A mm-hmm. couple weeks ago, we put out our "How Coaches Get Made" show, which people, people seem, seem to, to like enjoy. Yeah. People seem to enjoy that. Uh, we had a lot of fun with the show we did last week as well. So you know, we're doing our best here to make the time pass in the doldrums that are the college football off season. Now we've been doing this for a number of years now. Yeah. And one of the shows that I know you mentioned to me earlier in the week that we need to plan out, that we need to make sure happens. All right. Uh, this history of the solid verbal. Yes. The ultimate navel gaze. So I believe that's going to happen tentatively at some point in July. We've had a couple people ask us when when might yeah. that show be uh, in the build up to what will be our 10th college football regular season, which is crazy. We will be doing a history of style show at some point later this summer. You will not be revealing the secret day job. I will not be revealing the <sighs> secret day job, but we will be giving you a, a unique behind the scenes look at how the sausage gets made here, how it's gotten made over the years. Yeah. So this will be our 10th season, like football season together. Yeah. Crazy. So that's sort of a, a preamble to that. If you haven't, and even if you don't listen to the, the podcast, um, as you should, that's insane. Listen to the starters, formerly known as the Basketball Jones. They did it, I want to say last year or the year before. Yeah. And it's an incredible listen, just like how far those guys have come. They're now on N- NBA TV. Um, so really proud of them. And hopefully you guys will enjoy because every once in a while we have people say, hey, I don't know how you guys sort of started this up and met. And then we'll be able to send them an hour and a half link. <laughs> like, here you go. Yeah. Yep. Everything you could possibly want to know about us and what was going on in our lives as everything was transpiring with the show and we were growing and how we did things and how we think we did things. So we're going to do that over the summer at some point. We've got another show planned with our friend Bill Barnwell. Oh, yes. A look back at a, at a new topic before it was emo. We're going to, to wax nostalgic about something else that oh, we have God. planned. I am so uh, excited about this show, Dan. I know. I know it. I love it. Yeah. Um, so we, we've got some plans. And because the the feedback on the How College Football Worked episode with the coaching hires seemed to be exceedingly positive, which we're never quite used to, um, we have a, a, a plan, I think, to do a couple more of those. Hopefully we can get it all done yeah. in the spring. But Ty, I'm getting married in three and a half weeks. Yes. I got some plans. You got some so, plans. No, but we have time. So I think we can knock out a couple more of those during the off season. That is the plan. We thank you for listening. Don't forget you can subscribe at iTunes.com slash solid verbal or anywhere fine podcasts are sold or mm-hmm. given away for free. Look us up. We're the solid verbal. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the works. Um, okay. So Dan. Yeah. What are, what are we doing today? Oh, Ty. Love that that song behind you. Uh, today we're going to look into some crystal balls. We're going to look into the future. We're going to look into the horizon. We're going to look into the layers of this universe, of college football, in which we live. And we're going to try to just find truth, Ty. We're going to look at the spring, and we're going to say, "This is a thing that exists. What does it mean for the future? What is it? That song just sort of comes at you in waves, doesn't it? Right." It, it starts up, it comes down. There's I laughed, also, a, a I mix cried, of emotions. I was angry, yeah. Really, it's the whole game there. Time. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to bring on our friend, Bill Connolly of SB Nation, podcast Ain't Played Nobody, and of course his new book uh, about the 50 best and most interesting and greatest teams uh, of all time and talk about that as well. So 
again, packed full of emotions, Ty. We're going to look into the future. We're going to look into the past. We're going to stay in the present. This show is is literally a, just it's a thrown together good time. Without further ado, let's welcome in our friend Bill Connolly. Sir, how are you? I'm good. How are you? You're already previewing teams. You've been previewing teams for a couple months now. Yeah. I'm almost done with the mid majors. As a matter of fact, finished, finished AAC, got the AAC power rankings coming up, got Indies on deck, and then it's on to the Big Twelve, which is a power conference and is still better than the AAC. How do you how do you do that? Like, what is your process for acquiring that information so far in advance? I mean, the biggest thing, I mean, a lot of it is obviously pulling off of last year's stats. And so I'll set that up in January, kind of a template for each one. Uh, and then as I get close to each preview, then, you know, I'll have everything set up for in this template and then I'll just go in and add guys or, you know, subtract the guys who left. It is kind of tricky early on because it takes until probably the end of February, uh, AKA after I'm done with the Sun Belt, for, for teams to really start a- uh, updating those 2017 rosters. So I'll do my best, but there's, there's no way to avoid kind of getting some, some roster bits wrong here and there for the, for the early team. And occasionally if I actually get my act together and I work ahead a couple days, I'll end up with something like the NIU preview where it was like late March and their quarterback from last year uh, that I, I'm blank on his name, Maddie or something like that. Um, he it looked like he was going to get a sixth year. He was listed on the roster. They had started spring practice. I took that to mean that he had gotten his sixth year as planned. Uh, and then like two days before I actually wrote the preview, it came out that he had been denied. So uh, occasionally you'll get that, but I, 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 I get most of it right. I think Ty, you know what I'm hearing? I'm hearing that Bill uses current information to try and look into the future. Oh. That's what I'm hearing, Ty. All right, Dan. Yeah. Do tell. What is the name of this game? Oh, that's a great question. Um, We are going to call it the uh, solid verbal... uh, Cloudy glimpse into the netherfall. The psychic network, the solid verbal psychic network. Yeah, I like that. I like that as well. I like netherfall though. Netherfall. How does this work? What is the netherfall? Okay, so what we do, we have a number of items and we are using spring storylines, which a lot of people think don't mean anything because spring games are generally not that competitive and we don't have teams playing as one. We have teams that are split up and we have scoring that's a little bit wonky and we have injuries and walk-ons playing a significant role and it's really not representative of what we're going to see in the fall, but there are always nuggets, Ty. There are always nuggets. So that many tur- nuggets. That they might turn into the full rotisserie chicken, Ty. Ah, okay. So... We are going to try and look at some nuggets, either from spring games or storylines or just situations around the world of college football and glimpse into that cloudy crystal ball to see if we can get any clarity to see what might, in fact, Ty, be big. Now, I understand it's a a bit of a mixed metaphor, Ty, because the movie Big involves changing your, your current status. We haven't heard from Bill in a while. You're still over there, right? We haven't bored you to death. I, I'm just trying to figure out if you guys have the copyright for that. No. Um, well, it's who's to say, Bill? Who is to say? <laughs> uh, please don't. Please don't turn us in. Um, so, yeah, we are going to uh, – we have a number of situations. We're going to go through some some preseason, pr- post-spring top 25s, and we're just going to figure out by looking into our mythical nether fall ball right. what, what actually may or may not matter, Ty. I'm still trying to figure out how chicken nuggets are backwards compatible with the rotisserie chicken, but that – Oh, you'll see. That can be a podcast for deeper into the offseason, Dan. Shall we present our first topic? Can you look I into think that we crystal should. ball? What, what is it that we are trying to trying to foresee? Okay, so as we know, as Bill and you and the college football universe at large knows, Ohio State has a new offensive coordinator in Kevin Wilson, Mm -hmm. and based on his time both in in Bloomington and for Oklahoma, where he really opened things up, and uh, historic offense with Sam Bradford and the Sooners, people are expecting Ohio State to be a much more open offense, to, to spread it out a little bit more, to throw downfield a little bit more. And that's what happened this fall, excuse me, this spring. Joe Burrow, um, Dwayne Haskins, and of course, the starter JT Barrett all threw the ball downfield a ton more with the two backups as sort of more successful in a spring game. That didn't mean all that much. We know Ohio State and Urban Meyer 
have a history of perhaps starting the wrong quarterback recently. So what I'm saying, will Ohio State be a squad that really opens things up on offense? What do we see? And will it be JT Barrett as the trigger man? Oh. All right. Mr. Connolly, let's throw it over to you. You heard the setup. What see you wise soothsayer in your crystal ball? You know, I always lean with the incumbent. Uh, you know, we always fall in love with the other options, but in the end, I mean, the guy who's been around for a few years and, and has won a lot of games tends to win that job. And so without knowing the ins and outs of, of Joe Burrow's strengths and weaknesses or Dwayne Haskins or whoever, uh, I will assume that Barrow keeps his job, uh, Barrow Barrett, excuse me, keeps his job. Uh, and you know, with, you know, I, I, what I always liked about Kevin Wilson offenses is they're just for lack of a better term, they're logical. They basically, you know, to set this up, that means we have to do this. And once this is set up and defenses will do this, then we can do this. And part of that is going deep. When you, if you want to be able to run the ball, well, you got to be able to stretch the field a little bit. Um, and uh, you know, the, the lack of a go-to receiver could be an issue. We all, I mean, Noah Brown was great that one game. Um, and they have, uh, Lord knows they have got like 13 other four star kids who could uh, come up big, but uh, you know, assuming they've got decent options, for stretching the field, they'll do it because that's just what you do in a logical offense, I guess. Uh, and if they can, then, I mean, everything else works. JT Barrett doesn't throw a terrible deep ball. Obviously, uh, he doesn't have the best arm in the world, but the whole point is uh, a lot of times those, those balls are going to be really open uh, and you just have to take them. Uh, and if, you do, if they do that, then the run game should be killer. This is the question that I have about their new offense under Kevin Wilson. And I said this to you weeks ago, Dan, the Kevin Wilson offense that we've seen in the past at Indiana, uh, certainly at Oklahoma when he was still working down there, it does not seem to be necessarily compatible with the skill set of JT Barrett. And so I've questioned how is that all going to go? Now, right. your counterpoint was, well, you know, they, they ran a little bit and they were a little bit different stylistically at Indiana, and that's true. But I'm just kind of curious to see how he melds in his previous system with now the personnel grouping at Ohio State. You look at the schedule, they actually do play Oklahoma fairly early on in the year. That's not going to be an easy game. Then they've got a little bit more runway where they can can work things out before they get to Penn State, before they get to Michigan State, and obviously close out the year at Michigan. So I think all will be fine for Ohio State. I've kind of uh, seen cloudy things when I look into my crystal ball about how that offense starts its season. Ty, play the sound again for me, please. Oh, it's lovely. It's very uh, mysterious, but kind of it's soothing. Mysterious. So this is what I do. I, I look into this ball, Ty, and I see clarity for the first six or seven weeks. Not a lot of big defenses on Ohio State schedule, but then Halloween, music very appropriate. I see a lion, Ty. I see energy. I see vibrations. I see a nittany lion. I see trouble for Ohio State on offense in that game against a team, Penn State, that returns a lot of defensive players. Not the defensive ends, but defensive players nonetheless. And I think by that, by Iowa State, Michigan State in there, sometime before the Michigan game, I see rotating quarterbacks. I see a quarterback controversy. And I see Joe Burrow perhaps even supplanting JT Barrett. How about that? Would you say he's digging in at quarterback? I would not. I would never. I would. That is not okay. Just checking. Just checking. Yeah. Fair enough. Where are we going next? Okay. All right. Next. Ty, do we have, and on the subject of quarterback battles... Do we have a quarterback battle in Tuscaloosa following Ooh. Tua? And I'm going to get this right. Tongue of Aloha. Tag of Aloha. Tongue of Aloha. The true freshman from Hawaii coming in and completely shredding the defense that he saw in Alabama's spring game. Both he and Jalen Hurts had very good games with the new offensive coordinator throwing the ball downfield. We know Alabama now unafraid to play and start a true freshman at quarterback. Is it possible that Tua Tonga Valoga, Tua, 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 <laughs> Um, let's just go with Tua has a higher ceiling as a thrower than Jalen hurts who struggled in the back end, the back three, four games of Alabama's season. I got to use the sound again. Cause I love the sound. Do it. All right. I am selling this one. My crystal okay. ball nearly broke. When okay, I saw wow. this question on your list, why are you asking this? How could you possibly ask this given what Jalen hurts did last year? Ty, as the surest thing in college football. Is this what I feel this is like a Ouija board scenario where you kind of involuntarily want to believe 
that Jalen Hurts might be supplanted by someone else, and therefore your involuntary muscles pushed you towards. Oh, Alabama fans have been uh, have been very much pushy <laughs> for that too. So uh, it's out there. It's out there. Wow. Okay. So. You're not wrong to say that Jalen Hurts struggled against some of the better defenses he played, certainly down the stretch, but yep. he still was a true freshman. He still had a ton of talent around him. He it, he was in his first year. Give him a little bit of slack, even though he's at Alabama. <laughs> I think there is plenty of reason to be excited about your quarterback depth at Alabama, but he got you to the national championship game. And he looked a hell of a lot better throwing the football down the field. That seemed to be the focus of their spring football game to try and get a little bit more of a deep threat established offensively. Look at those numbers. You mentioned, well, how did Dan, I'd like to hear you say that name again to uh, what was it? Tagovailoa. Tagovailoa. Thank you. Tungavaloa, I believe. Tungavaloa. Yeah. 17 of 29 for 313 passing. That's not bad. Jalen Hurts, by the way, 16 of 25 for 301. So not that big a disparity. I think he is the guy. It's good to know that if and when he goes pro or if and when he should go down with injury, you've got another fallback option. But no, I don't see that. I don't see him being supplanted anytime soon. Bill, look into the orb. I have seen, uh, you know, huddle film of Tagovailoa. So I consider myself an expert on all of his strengths and weaknesses. Absolutely. Um, He's got, uh, I mean, he's got a nice arm, obviously, but, uh, and, you know, it's easy to put, it's easy to piece this logic together because he has a nice arm. He can throw it deep and there's no question. I mean, Clemson, Clemson won the national title game by daring Jalen Hurts to connect deep. He did it once on that, that wheel route to Howard. He missed like two or three others that if he connects it, they, they win the national title and he just missed them. Uh, just overthrew them. And, and so you piece that together, you've got kind of a custom made, uh, quarterback battle here, but uh, I just, I, I, I'm just allergic to quarterback controversies. I hate them so much. And there's so much, so many of them start like this that I immediately start pushing back and just say, stop, st- just start hurts. You're fine. And, and, and let's stop right now. To be clear. I don't, I don't want this. You guys, I just see things. <laughs> I just look forward into the, the space, time, time, space, and, that's just what it told continuum. You, right. and I'm seeing, I'm seeing an issue here. And I think coupled with the fact that tag of Aloha, tongue of Aloha Tua has looked very good early is the fact that there's new offensive coordinator. So it's not like Jalen hurts is the guy of the complete offensive coaching staff. Maybe. Tua fits what the it's Brian something uh, comes in from the, the Patriots. Maybe he fits. Maybe he makes the throws. Maybe just maybe Ty. This is what the doctor ordered. The good doctor wanted some Hawaiian, some Hawaiian refreshments, a Hawaiian and, punch. Yeah. I look oh, here. Yeah. Here's the thing. You could start an old boot at quarterback for Alabama and they'd still right. find a way to win 10 games. This is a team that's loaded to the gills. And you can make a real strong case. Bill could probably find a statistical case for it doesn't matter who plays quarterback as long as he doesn't shoot himself in the foot. To simply have two quarterbacks that are mobile, agile, hostile the way these guys are, that is a luxury that exists at Alabama and maybe only a small handful of schools elsewhere around the country. I can be mean and point out that your your point is made by the fact that they won a national title with Greg McElroy, but I'm gonna I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna be mean. Nope, absolutely not. That's looking into the past. Regardless of who plays quarterback, Alabama will be just fine, even though, again, a ton of talent goes to the NFL. But I do think it's Hurts. I think your crystal ball is a little bit off, Dan. Got to reconfigure that thing. Easy to say in May. Easy to say in May. Okay, very good. Next item. This one's interesting to me. So the Pac-12 South is yet to win the conference as a whole. Sam Darnold has rightfully received a ton of attention as a Heisman candidate, perhaps the number one overall draft pick next spring. Uh, USC has a bit of a tricky schedule to start out the season. A number of offensive line, wide receiver, secondary losses. You know, the, the ship isn't fully running smoothly yet with Clay Helton only entering his second year with the Trojans. USC as what appears to be the overwhelming favorite with still Washington right there. USC coming off a Rose Bowl win will not win the Pac-12. USC is going to trip up a little bit. Bill, look into that crystal ball. Is there cloudiness surrounding USC's fall? I think really the answer to that comes partially with what you think about Stanford because Stanford, I mean, they get Stanford in week two. 
Um, and you, you, these issues, we, you know, in theory, these issues get kind of worked out as we go along. I mean, goodness knows they've got talent uh, on the line and in, in re- the receiving core and whatnot. Uh, it's just kind of breaking in new pieces. So in theory, they finished the year a very good team. Um, but I mean, if they trip up early, that could hurt their national title caliber, their, their, their qualifications. Uh, and you know, maybe, uh, man, I can't, I, they're going to be awesome. I'm, I'm trying here, but they're going to be really good. Um, and uh, you the fact that Sam Darnold's able to, he's got really nice escapability that helps when you've got a, a, an iffy line and a, an iffy receiving core for that matter, because you can kind of wait for guys to, to come open or not and create on the, on the run. So I, I really, I'm struggling here. I think they're going to be just fine. Dan, you have the most pessimistic crystal ball. I think that exists in the college football. Either. I've got, I've got guys jumping up and, and executing. I've got, you know, a wide open, improved Pac-12. I'm thinking great things around the country, Ty. I'm seeing it in my orb. So again, we're talking about the Pac-12 as a whole. Mm-hmm. And, and I should point out, you you see this too in your orb of knowledge. Yes. Uh, USC misses Washington on their schedule. So yeah. we're talking about the Pac-12 as a whole and not just the Pac-12 South. That's correct. I think it's a distinct possibility that USC won't win the Pac-12. I don't necessarily think it's because their offensive line or their defensive backfield stalls out. It could just be because the Pac-12 is really good this year. It's really good. I think it just comes down to the to the Pac-12 title game. I mean, that's I, I you know they get Colorado on the road. Colorado sh- will take a step backwards. I don't know how much of one, but they will. Arizona State might not be ready yet on the road at Cal. Um, I, I really they get Utah and UCLA at home. It's hard for me to make the case for anybody else to win the South. But I mean, you're right. They're going to play a really good team on a neutral field uh, in in the Pac-12 title game, and therefore they they could obviously lose that. I'm seeing a lightning storm. And I'm seeing it on the outside offensively for USC. And defensively, we, we talk about the defensive backfield. You say I'm being too negative. I see a ton of positivity here because when you look at their schedule, how many good proven quarterbacks do you see? Yeah. I don't see, in, if you want to count Josh Rosen, which I think is reasonable, Ty, he might be the only one. And that's not till November 18th. You want to say Shane Bouchelle? I can't fully agree. And beyond that, Ty, Good proven quarterbacks are, I'm not seeing them in my cloudy orb. Hmm. You're not wrong. So I'm, th- I'm seeing positivity. I'm seeing electricity. I'm feeling good vibrations. Bill, you know, the only reason he put this in his crystal ball was because he wants Oregon to win the Pac-12, right? You know, oh, that, I don't, that is not in my orb. <laughs> All right. Keep shaking that thing. Where are we going next? Next. Bill, we'll start with you once again. Penn State in year two of the Joe Moorhead era, we'll have the clear best and deepest skill group in the big 10, even without, I believe Chris Godwin has departed to the NFL, but Saquon Barkley, they've got young receivers coming on strong. They've got experience on the offensive line, if not a couple of holes to fill, but trace McSorley in the effort, go deep offense, Penn state will have the clear, most dangerous and electric offense all season long in the big 10 with Ohio state's potential with Mike Weber, with Brown, with uh ball, et cetera. I can't say for sure that that's the case because they Ohio state exists, but if Juwan Johnson turns out to be as good as, as everybody from Penn state says he is, and he had a great mm-hmm. spring and all that, if that, if he's there, you know, sorry, black Nile's still there. Mike Kosicki might be the best tight end in the country. Saquon Barkley rushed for 1500 yards without an offensive line, which is really tricky and hard to do. Uh, I've heard, um, Miles Sanders, as soon as he learns to not drop the ball, he's going to be amazing. So yeah, I'd say the potential's there, but Ohio state's still going to have a little something to say about it. I think when you look at Penn State's schedule again, in your crystal ball bill, where do you feel the biggest landmines are? Because if I step through it here, Akron, Pitt, Georgia State, at Iowa, Indiana, Northwestern, Michigan's going to be tough, but they lose a, a ton on defense. They're kind of starting over in some respects on offense. Ohio State, obviously, the most name brand variety uh, of landmines. <laughs> But Michigan State still trying to find their way after last year. Rutgers, Nebraska, entirely new defense, and at Maryland, who maybe could be sneaky. But it just, it, perhaps it's rhetorical. It just doesn't look to me like there is so much ammo on that schedule that 
uh, they're in any real danger of falling below, you know, 10, nine wins at the absolute minimum. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about them as a national title contender, then they can't drop any of those games because of Ohio state probably, but, and you could really make a case that, okay, so maybe Iowa Northwestern and Michigan state or well, and I mean, Maryland too, that they all won't really seriously challenge Penn state, but one of them, it could most likely trip them up. And so that's kind of that the, the, the lots of landmines there on the road, even if we don't count Ohio state, which is not a, it's which is a little too big to be called a landmine, I would say. But yeah. um, if we're talking about, if we're setting the bar at nine, or 10 wins. Yeah. I'd say they've got a very, very good chance to do that. Their defense is fine. I mean, it's not necessarily good enough to stop an elite level offense. There aren't a lot of elite offenses on that schedule, especially with pit rebuilding. So um, they're probably going to, they're looking at worst, probably 10 wins. I think unless McSorley gets hurt and then who knows after that. Right. Okay. So here's where I'm going to go ahead and renew my pessimistic trace McSorley card. Dan, please tie. Um, I was not sold on Trace for a good chunk of last season. And then the Minnesota game happened. They seemed to use him a little differently. Mm -hmm. He obviously caught fire, was throwing the ball downfield like a, like a mad banshee and Iowa game was great. Yeah. I mean, he, he was great. He was objectively great. Second half of last season. For some reason, I still remain unconvinced of his skill set. I know the kid's a winner. I know he got it done last year. I'm curious to see what he does without Chris Godwin. Perhaps that's just me being artificially pessimistic, but for some odd reason, I just, I have a hard time trusting that he's got staying power to be that good all the time. Well, yeah, anytime our, you know, we're relying on a, uh, on a collection of four, five, six games to completely, I mean, think about what everybody was saying about Penn state at the end of September. Um, and now they're this no, they're this supposedly known quantity, uh, absolute surefire, big 10 national title contender, et cetera. When, you know, a month into last year, people thought James Franklin was going to get fired. So right. when the perceptions changed that quickly, yeah, it's, it's sometimes worth it to kind of tap the brakes a little bit and, and really kind of reassess. But uh, yeah, the last half, last year they were amazing on offense absolutely so i guess with that in mind dan yes perhaps to bill's point of needing a little bit more data to feel truly comfortable i will stop short of saying that penn state has the clear the best or or the deepest skill group in the big 10 but they're certainly in the equation if mcsorley keeps doing what he did at the second half of last season then then they're definitely uh in a very strong position to take the cake now, Ty, as I look into the horizon, <laughs> can I hear my music, please, Ty? Can I hear my music as I look into the horizon? Thank you. I see calm waters for Penn State for the first five or six weeks, Ty. But then as I look into my orb, I see them nowhere near central Pennsylvania. And that is because three of four games on the road, Northwestern, Ohio State, and Michigan State, all the way from Central PA, all the way from the... Is there a valley, Ty? Yeah. Where they're located? Yeah, yeah. Is it a happy valley? It's very happy, normally. I see unhappiness... Oh, my gosh. ...away from the valley. Not in the form of Ohio State. Not in the form of Michigan within the valley. But two weeks of body blows before traveling to East Lansing. I see a trip-up spot there. I, I, I see a D. I see an IS. I see a RE. And I see a SPECT. With Michigan State. To answer the question, though, Penn State will indeed, because of Saquon Barkley and the attention he'll receive up front, have the clear best, deepest skill group in the Big Ten, and they win the conference once again. How about that? Wow. Okay. All right. We got another one on here. Go ahead. We do. Yeah. Clemson. Mm, Tigers. Clemson. Yeah. Yeah. With their quarterback struggles this spring being an eye to the fall where they don't have obviously an incumbent with Deshaun Watson off to the NFL and the Houston Texans, Kelly Bryant, I believe one gentleman's name is Israel. Um, That's all I really, that's, there's a, a, a freshman that is promising, but all of them sort of struggled in the spring, both on the field and with injury to really make a mark. Clemson has a very good defense, but schedule's not great. They have Auburn early. They're on the road at Louisville. They're on the road in Blacksburg. Uh, They're at the Carrier Dome on a Friday night. I already don't like it. I already (laughs) don't like it. Um, They have Florida State at home. But I say Clemson will not. This is what the ball is telling me. Mm, Okay. 
make a New Year's Six bowl game this wow. season. Such pessimistic balls, Dan. Um, but it's just tough. And yeah. yes, I I am with you. I think that early season matchup against Auburn will be a bit of a menace for them. And not to say Auburn's going to be back to Cam Newton days, but I feel like they should be good enough on defense to challenge Clemson to keep things a bit confusing for whoever ends up playing quarterback. And they've obviously got that Florida state game later in the year. Florida state should be really good this season. You never know what happens when you go to Virginia tech. You never know if there's another game lurking, you know, I think by the end of the year, they'll be fine at quarterback. I really do. Dabo Sweeney will find a way to coach up that position group, but to start out, knowing that they've lost a lot from last season offensively, it's going to take them a while to get things going. So I think just in general, offensive struggles, offensive uncertainty could mean them missing a New Year's Six Bowl game, maybe not specifically that quarterback group. I I think I agree because there are a lot of good defenses on that schedule. And um, I mean, they'll have the defense to kind of, you know, it'll be a lot of gross games, maybe like Auburn Clemson last year was, Uh, but Auburn's going to have a good defense. Louisville could Boston college could Virginia tech will Um, NC state might have one of the best run defenses in the country this year. Uh, And they play at Virginia tech at NC state. It does feel like there are a couple losses in there. Uh, And I, you know, obviously Florida state at South Carolina, uh, there are a lot of opportunities there where there will be a very, very good team, but they'll finish 10 and two uh, and then have to settle for a new year's bowl or something to that effect instead of a new year's six bowl, uh, which is just, you know, a, t- a crushing disappointment of a season. I realize. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing them missing that new year's six bowl tie. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I'm with in, you. in my visions, in my vibrations and my energies in front of me, I'm seeing some struggles and I think Bill hit it, hit it on the head. They struggled with NC state with Deshaun Watson, yeah. with Mike Williams, with Jordan Leggett, with Wayne Gallman. And I think, listen, take it from, take it from me, take it from a Notre Dame fan in you that even though you get good quarterback play year in and year out for what seems like a long time, you, you get it until you don't Ty, and it can disappear quickly. It's a, it's an elixir that not every, every team, every program has. And I think you're right. By the end of the season, I think they'll have something going. But early on, I think that it's going to be a little bit rocky, and that's going to cost them a a January 1 game. All right. There you have it. This has been an illuminating look, Dan, into the pessimistic and optimistic crystal balls here in the Solid Verbal. While we've got Bill, yes, we do need to talk about something else. I mentioned it at the top when we introduced him, but... He's got a book out. It's called The 50 Best College Football Teams of All Time. I read to you directly from the official description of the book that Bill Connolly dives into history and evolution of the sport, telling its story through 50 particularly interesting teams. Now, this is across the rich history of college football. It's not just 50 teams over the last 50 years or anything like that. As I'm sure you are aware, Bill, like the hardest thing to do in sports is compare eras and your books entirely about comparing eras. How do you put a hundred or a hundred plus years of college football on an equal playing field and try to try to suss this all out? Well, I start by not actually trying to determine the best at all. Um, that was, uh, that is a little misdirection on the cover. As you see the little asterisk there, the little antisocial asterisk that I, you know, probably shouldn't have had. And it'd be a lot easier to explain, but yeah, this is 50 easy, uh, 50 interesting, influential, innovative teams uh, that allowed me to tell college football story. So I was able to kind of, you know, I was a set list nerd when I was going to concerts in college. And, and this is uh, a set list crafted to allow me to do that from some offensive innovators to some defensive innovators, teams that just had crazy wacky years, uh, teams that were awesome teams that were almost awesome. Uh, and, and I was able to kind of piece it together there to where if you read it straight through, it tells college football so, uh, story. If you skip around to just the teams you want, it's fine. You, you know, you'll, you'll get that, that team story too. Uh, but you can kind of trace the evolution from 1906 Chicago to, to, uh, to 2013 Auburn pretty well, I think. Well, football is unique in the way it's evolved both in the rules of the game and and the styles and schemes within the game you see it year to year but i'd imagine if you look at it over a hundred plus years you're really going to get a full sense for how much the game has changed let's assume football's around in 50 years 
what what does it look like? Where is it headed now in 2017 relative to where it was and where you think it's going to head? Well, I mean, I think basically it's you know the, the Spencer Hall's piece earlier in this uh, earlier this week at SB Nation kind of covered the same thought pretty well. Uh, you know, it gets faster and it gets more spread out. That's kind of the way things have gone. That's probably the way they'll keep going to some degree, and and, and there are a million ways to do that. But I, I, that's that's kind of where it goes. And so, um, yeah, wh- when you compare when you compare 1906 Chicago to 2013 Auburn, you kind of you see that the way that motion. Well, like 1917 uh, Georgia Tech, uh, they. Used the jump shift basically a bunch of guys would literally jump uh to kind of change the matchups or change the numbers that was the, their version of, of of auburn running motion on every single play to figure out where the numbers advantages were for trey mason in 2013 um and there's just a lot of that you see and and i mean it, it was still all you know college football is so rich because it has been around so freaking long and so there have been so many teams uh so many programs that, that have hundred plus year histories that's not something we can really say about many pro sports i mean even based balls run around forever. They haven't had a hundred plus uh, teams playing major uh, division ball. And so there's all this, uh, the, the, the quote unquote pomp, pomp and circumstance that makes it all college football. Uh, and, and the fact that you're always using 18 to 22, yeah, 22 year old males to play the game uh, kind of ensures that you have a, a, a certain similarities from era to era, but no, the game's going to get faster. It's going to get uh, in theory, a little bit less violent. And uh, I'm betting it will probably still exist in 50 years. Harder or easier to build a truly dominant team in 1930? Um, well, you know, you had the advantage of, you know, minimal film and, uh, you know, you had a lot of advantages like that, but you also, nobody was recruited nationally except for maybe Notre Dame at that point. So, uh, you were kind of more a, a victim of, of the talent at hand. And so I would say more difficult, uh, but also harder to tell if you're dominant or if you're dominant nationally, at least because, yeah, you know, unless you're Notre Dame, you're only playing teams within your region and then maybe a bowl opponent at the end of the year and bowl and, and teams really didn't take bowls all that seriously then. So uh, I would say it was probably less, it was, it was either harder to build a dominant team or know you had a dominant team. Bill, if nothing else, the book seems to sort of be a way for you, a vehicle for you to talk about what you sort of love about the sport. And it looks to me, and I insist that you correct me if I'm wrong, especially <laughs> with some of the modern teams that you've chosen, but even throughout the history. So your first team in here is the 1906 uh, University of Chicago team, and the final team on here is your 2013 or college football's 2013 Auburn Tigers. But it seems that if there is the through point, it's sort of the idea of coming out of nowhere. Like you have 2007 with Chip Kelly coming out of nowhere, Boise State coming out of nowhere, 2013 Gus Malzahn coming as a as a high school coach, you know, a Wimbledon <laughs> from Arkansas. You have a Dartmouth team in 1970. You have Michael Vick and Virginia Tech exploding onto the national stage without really a rich history, a rich modern history before then. Is that something that? feels unique to college football because the feeding system almost is so unknown to everybody outside of that one local ecosystem for that team. Yeah, there's probably a good, and I, there are a lot of examples like, um, you know, choosing 04 Texas instead of 05, 94 Nebraska instead of 95. I think the bottom line is right. if I would have actually written a book about the 50 absolute best teams, uh, you know, 45 of them, them would have finished undefeated, and about half of them, it would have basically been the same story to tell over and over again with different names. And so the interesting part to me is, yeah, sometimes it's the parts you didn't expect or the things that happened right before the big run. 04 Texas being the best example of that. That was the team where, you know, uh, we were talking about Penn State and and the fact that you know the perceptions changed so quickly. Well, halfway through 2004, uh, Vince Young was a disappointment. He was getting benched uh, because he mm-hmm. you know he, they got shut out against Oklahoma. He got benched against Missouri because he was throwing terrible interceptions. Uh, he was not Vince Young until late in that season, uh, and that was that's a more interesting story. 94 Nebraska having to deal with Tommy Frazier's injuries um, and and dealing with actual adversity instead of the 95 team, which just wrecked everybody. It was 
a lot more interesting to tell those stories. So I do think I leaned to, uh, into it, especially especially for the more recent teams where I knew more about them heading in. Like some of the the older teams, I mean, like ninety uh, forty five Army was the best team of all time. That one's pretty. That was interesting to tell because of all the transfers and all that. But it was still just dominant game after dominant game. Uh, as I got to you know more recent times, I did seem to favor the uh, the surprises or the out of nowhere things or just the you know the, uh, the realized greatness part instead of just a full season of domination it's obviously going to be nearly impossible to pick one or two or three but college football maybe more than any other sport is it seems like it's defined by larger than life personalities of the coaches was there anybody (laughs) when researching this i mean you look through all the, you know, you have Steve Spurrier, you have Don James, you have um, Tom Devaney, and you have, there's just like, a, there's a million different people. You have less miles on here. Are there personalities going back in time that you were not expecting to either like or be intrigued by as much as you were? You know, I was really happy that I chose 65 UCLA for the book because Tommy Prothrow was fascinating. I wish he had never gone to the pros. I wish he, like, he belonged with college football. You know, he carried Mm -hmm. a briefcase around. Nobody ever knew what was in it. Uh, He (laughs) said all these really super weird quirks. And he was a, a I mean, he got got a a Heisman winner at Oregon State. And then he goes and wins the Rose Bowl his first year at UCLA. Like, that was, he was a very, very interesting character that maybe because he left for the pros when he did, uh, he, he isn't quite as... Um, as as regarded as well known as other coaches, he was awesome though. And plus, that sixty five UCLA team, it, there was kind of a a sense of discovery about some of the older teams. Just in that, I made I, I made my you know my quote unquote set list, and uh, before I kind of knew everything I maybe needed to know about some of these teams, and so it was a discovery process. And the sixty five team ending with you know a, a dramatic comeback went over uh, USC, and then randomly going to Memphis to play Tennessee and getting screwed on a couple of calls, and, and Tennessee scoring the, the game winning touchdown by like a millimeter, and then knocking off Michigan State at the last second to win the Rose Bowl. That was one of the more Auburn twenty. 13 Auburn-ish kind of uh, dramatic uh, seasons that I was really happy at, that I chose. Of the uh, of the coaches and programs that you profiled here, there there's also a theme of adaptability. You know, this wrinkle happened to the team or to the sport, the conference, whatever, and this is how this team changed things up or responded or, you know, reversed course. Um, is there a specific coach that you feel or co- series of coaches, whatever, that you feel like has a sort of timeless quality that could, you know, if it's, you know, Bobby Bowden in 1981, whoever it is, um, that could have succeeded in 1937 just as well as they could have succeeded in 2004. Some, is there a guy that, that fits that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I pro throw didn't have a, a specific, uh, formula to go by. So he was probably on the list, but I mean, bear Bryant's another one where, you know, the, the changes he made, uh, you know, as his program began to stagnate and just created this, this, uh, decade of dominance in the seventies, not just integrating his roster, obviously, but also, uh, catching on to the success of the wishbone early kind of, uh, breaking it in or installing it in the dead of night, basically after spring ball had ended, uh, so that he could unleash hell in, in 1971. That was pretty fun. Bowden's another one I think that that could have succeeded in a lot of ways, but um, yeah, there are some some guys that are you know that either made the book or just were great in general because of the combination of style. Like Barry Switzer, you know, would he have succeeded without the wishbone? He, he kind of tried to succeed without the wishbone in the in right. the early '80s, and it didn't work. He kind of had to go back to his baby a little bit. But um, but yeah, there are certain coaches who like uh, you know John Heisman, uh, you know, obviously uh, Stag was. Uh, is the ultimate example of a guy who just like, Oh, you're changing the rules. All right. Well, that'll allow me to draw up these new plays and I'm going to beat you like this instead. I mean, they were a dominant team before the forward pass. They were a dominant team for a while after the forward pass. So that there are plenty of examples of guys like that. That were pretty fun tinkerers. Uh, and, 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 you know, I really, since Stag has awards named after him, maybe we should start there. Bill, what'd you learn that you didn't know? Or if there are too many things to answer that, <laughs> What was your favorite thing that you learned while doing this? I, I think I decided that the the sport was really that it, it became 
itself uh, in the mid 1920s and early 1930s, because in that little period of time, you had Notre Dame becoming Notre Dame and, and you know, getting the, the, getting the people in charge of the university to allow them to go to the Rose Bowl and then winning the Rose Bowl, uh, you know, and, and kind of becoming that national name. You had Alabama winning the Rose Bowl for the entire South the very next year. And the South at that point, then the, the Southern schools that actually really kind of enjoyed football, getting together a few years later, creating the SEC and, you know, et cetera from there, I guess. But then, you know, in 1930, but with the, uh, with, with the depression kind of sinking in, I, I wrote about 1930 Utah, a team that was amazing and had nobody to play basically, but they were trying to set up benefit games in the, uh, it, after the season against USC or some team at Yankee stadium, just to kind of prove how good they were. Uh, number one, they had to give that up because uh, they had a basketball season to play and all those same guys were awesome at basketball and they went like 18 and three. But number two, that was uh, the, the idea of a, of a, of a depression era benefit game is why army night and Navy started playing every year. And so all these things that happened in that little bitty period of time from Notre Dame to the creation of the sec to army Navy, all of that carried forward and kind of defined the sports. So that was that I, you know, if I, if I'd known how, what some of the really good resources were that I was going to be able to pull from newspapers.com among them really, I would have maybe chosen a few, a few more old teams uh, because you really see a, like a, there's a load of teams in the seventies, eighties, nineties. I would have chosen more from that era because it really was a nice learning process. Bill, was there a specific year or time when you can point to the fact that this, you know, it, it starts out as this hyper, hyper local sport, slowly yeah. expands to becoming regional and then finally becomes a national sport. I would assume relatively recently because of the advent of the ability to watch so many games on TV. Yeah. Is do, could you see when you were researching when the sort of switches got flipped from being sort of hyper local, maybe at the state level, maybe region level, maybe half of the country level and, and national level? Were there specific tipping points or was it, in fact, sort of super gradual? Well, the first one was Notre Dame becoming a national brand. And then during the war, you know, being able to kind of keep some of his players with a, with, because of a connection with Navy during the war that they were able to dominate during that time, having that national name helped. Uh, but really, yeah, I mean, it goes down to, was it the NCAA versus Board of Regents of Oklahoma in the, in their mid eighties there, the Supreme court case that basically said that teams could, uh, uh, align with each other and create their own television deals. Uh, that plus the creation of ESPN and the emergence of ESPN. And created what we know of. There, it wasn't two or three or four or five games a week. It's every game is now televised, uh, and that just that level of exposure changes everything. That's kind of when it, when it started going down the road of becoming a true national sport. And and that is you know what I, the part of the rationale for writing this book in general is because it is our our history is so regionalized in this sport. And in, in that you know Alabama fans know Alabama's history, but not necessarily USC's and Oklahoma's and Notre Dame's, and we all have our own history. But books, uh, but we don't have a, just a ton of books that really tie everybody's history together. And so that was one of the goals of the book. Who is the most upset that a specific team was left out? Which fan base and which team <laughs> do you acknowledge that? Yes, you have a point. I couldn't make it the best 744 teams of all time. <laughs> Where has where has the tidal wave of criticism? I assume good natured criticism come from. Well, uh, well, number one, Miami fans uh, yelling that I didn't include 2001 Miami because no matter how many times I explained that it wasn't just the best teams uh, and <laughs> yep. there was more, I had explained that a lot to, to Miami fans. Uh, Penn's, I, Penn State fans had a legitimate gripe. Um, I, there was really there were two or three Penn State teams that were on the initial. Like when I created a list of all the teams I wanted to cover, it was like 107, uh, and there were like three of them on there. But you know, for for quote unquote set list purposes, one of them didn't end up making there uh, the list. So that was an obvious. If you're just looking at the big name programs, not having Penn state on there, uh, you know, obviously with some awkwardness now about everything that we defined as the Joe Paterno era, that didn't help. Uh, but that was, uh, I think something I couldn't quite figure out. Arkansas was another one that didn't make it and should, but really, uh, fans of the, of, of Kansas state were just sad that the, that, that like the 98 Kansas state team didn't make it or something. And, and that made me sad. All right, Bill, final question. It's open-ended. Why should people, why should college football fans read this book? Because it tells the story of college football, and it, and it uh, you know, we are fans of college football. We all have our team, uh, but this is this tells the sports story and tells uh, it's pretty much guaranteed to tell you a lot of things you didn't know, uh, and and it really it just ties together. I, I said this on podcast, ain't played nobody earlier today too. This is a, such a huge sport in terms of 
the number of people it takes to put a team together and take it on the road to play another team. The number of people involved and invested in the sport is just ridiculously big. Uh, and, and so being able to tell not only 50 stories, but 50 stories from like 42 different teams, every region, every era, I, I think really, it was very exciting. It was, uh, it, it was a long time. It took uh, quite a few number of months to, to write this, but it was really worth it because it, it, you could see the, the stories all kind of being intertwined a little bit and, and, and a nice, it's a nice, reminded that we're all in this together i guess that's the that's the handholdy way to say it very good his name is bill Connolly. find his fine work at sb nation don't forget to buy his book again the 50 best college football teams of all time and lest we forget podcast ain't played nobody him and stephen godfrey do a wonderful college football podcast which we would recommend yes. to everyone that listens to uh the verbal bill hope you're doing well we will talk to you soon and uh, it's a long off season so keep doing what you do Sounds good. All right, Dan, again, Bill Connolly. Yep. SB Nation podcast ain't played nobody. Don't forget to buy his book. We'll put the link in the description of this show, the 50 best college football teams of all time. Mm -hmm. And he sort of gave away the game a little bit saying, well, the title might not be perfectly representative of what this book entails, but I like what he did. Bill's a student of the game. Anyone who's ever read Bill knows that he's a student of the game from nearly every aspect you can be. So I'm excited to dive in. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I'm I'm excited oh, okay. to dive have in to. And, uh, and learn a little bit more about the fine work that he did. Also, I enjoyed this show. I really like the sound. <laughs> I feel like I've got a new one that I can add Absolutely. to the arsenal now as we go through the offseason and uh, maybe can sub that one out for my hypothetical sound. I'm going to tell you something 100% real about Bill's book, The 50 Best Asterisk College Football Teams of All Time. It's a hell of a poop read, Ty. Really? It is. Because, listen, it's broken up. It's 50 teams. It's a couple hundred pages. So they're almost just like Bill boils everything down into what you need to know about each squad. And each he, he provides a ton of good context. But there have been times where I've said to myself, you know what? I'm going to exercise today. Or I am going to eat a little extra fiber so I have some more reading time with Bill. <laughs> That's 100% true that ginger tea is very good for it. Um if you go with some stuff that that really suits your factory well, you can get down with Bill in a very intimate way. Now would be a good time to point out that one of the off-season shows that we uh, will be doing. <laughs> this is your dream show. <laughs> I, I don't believe we're going to do the bathroom etiquette show. We're not going to do that. We, we shouldn't do that. Let me ask you this. People Ty. would be repulsed if we did that, but I've got may stories. I, may I follow up with your statement please, that I've not agreed to? If we do a Q&A, say, next week, as we've been doing early on in the off-season months, and people okay. happen to write in with questions about bathroom etiquette, and it's mixed into a general college football, non-college football show, will you reveal some of your secrets about <sighs> the bathroom? I mean, I'm going to have to be extremely careful about how I word some of the responses here. It doesn't have to be corporate bathroom etiquette. It could oh, okay. Be. Okay, right. So we're not specifying, right? It could be home. It could be at the in-laws. It could be, you know, you're in the middle of the street in Chicago and you need to, is it a Barnes and Noble situation? You right, know, right. maybe talk about what you do if you're on a college campus and how to scope out the best bathroom. If people want to ask questions about it, okay. I might have to go through and handpick the ones that I'm willing to answer, but you know this. No one else knows this. There right. isn't a week that that goes by that I don't message you about a new bathroom etiquette observation. This is, true. this is absolutely true. Yeah. So what I'm saying is you don't need to bring your own experiences to the table, Ty. Yeah. We have listeners who work in offices of all kinds. I, we, could, we could broaden it to office etiquette. We got a great one about fingernail clipping at the office cubicle, oh, which I can elaborate course. on yeah. uh, based on a previous role. Yeah. Um. But yes, we will we will take any question that people yeah. have and Ty will give you his expertise based on his own experience. Mm. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Okay. I don't know how we got on that tangent. Oh, poop read. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Bill, yeah. Read this book. I mean, read it anywhere. Read it while you're traveling. Read it while you're on the beach. Read it, you know, at night before you go to sleep. But I'm just telling you, this is almost scientifically created and curated. For your thronal experience. Bill's going to love. He's going to love that ringing endorsement from. If there's another printing, I'd be happy to blurb it. 
Okay. I'd be happy to blow Well, we see the Amazon review under yes. an anonymous name. We'll know who it is. Yes, that's correct. Big thanks to Bill Connolly again. Don't forget to check him out. Again, SB Nation podcast ain't played nobody. The 50 best college football teams of all time. We will absolutely put that link in our podcast description. Mm -hmm. We're off until next Wednesday. We'll be back. Talk some more college football with all y'all. Don't forget, you can email us at saliverbal at gmail.com or find us on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, all the normal social media channels. In the meantime, tell your friends about the show. Subscribe at iTunes.com or wherever fine podcasts are sold. For that guy over there. In beautiful New York City, Dan Rubenstein. For myself here in good old Eastern PA, my name is Ty Hildenbrandt. We will catch you all in a week. In the meantime, stay solid. Peace.